Well, this is our lectionary Bible study for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, we will keep it as uh, Septuagesima in the Shrovetide or pre-Lent season. Um, but basically, uh, the, the lectionary stays the same. Uh, year C, I think we mentioned that. Let's look at the Collect of the Day. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandments we may please you both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. There's a little bit of right two and a little bit of right one, but uh, we'll make sure it's all good for Sunday. Uh, looking at the themes of the collect, um, and as I mentioned before, as we get uh, you know further away from Epiphany, um, we we lose more and more that kind of manifestation overall focus and theme. Um, <clears throat> it, remember the collect style is it, there's three segments. The last one is a doxology. The first one's an introduction and usually to, includes a description of God. And so notice how, O oh God, the strength of those who put their trust in you. So in other words, in, in the very fact of asking God for something, we begin by saying uh, God is somebody who we can uh, turn to for help, um, who we can rely upon, the strength of all those who turn to you in need of assistance. Accept our prayers because we're weak, we know that you're strong and you can help us with your grace. And basically what we're asking for is to be good Christians, uh, to keep your commandments, fulfill your will, live out a good Christian life. That's what we're looking for. And that's the kind of thing that is inherently in accord with God's will. Uh, God uh, has revealed that to us. He wants people who believe in him and trust him and follow his commandments and so on. Well, the first lesson is from Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. The, um, the Roman Catholic selection uh, stops short at verse 8, which I find intriguing because it, it misses the most impactful verses <laughs> that come at the end. Uh, so we'll, we'll pay attention to that. The last two verses um, is probably the most uh, famous um, and in fact, this, this little uh, parable, well, it's not a parable, but a little um, kind of wisdom story illustration is, is, is pretty famous too. In fact, it, it almost, it, it's, it's set off usually in a study Bible and to indicate it's poetry. Now, the oracles of God in the prophets are usually poetry in genre, um, but this looks like it's a wisdom saying. It may have even come before Jeremiah was something that he brought in to incorporate to um, uh, undergird his overall message because um, it sounds like something that's sort of been around uh, a long time. And in fact, it, it becomes kind of the common lore as we look at how very similar themes um, of this illustration are worked out in different places. As far as uh, any context, um, Scholars are a bit unsure, um, but the the leading idea is perhaps that it reflects um, in the uh, taking into exile that, that that there was a hope that perhaps Egypt could have helped them um, in their um, aggression from Babylon, and then of course you know Egypt uh, wasn't any help. So the the lesson was you know don't don't really trust in. Uh, worldly powers and worldly strength and so on. Your only trust is in the Lord. And we recognize we that was the whole problem when we got in trouble in the first place. We weren't trusting in the Lord. Uh, and so that's why we were taken into exile. So let's look at Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 10. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, 
or sh- I, I should put the emphasis different. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Now that definitely does cease the self-contained story, uh, but our pericope goes on for the commentary that follows. Verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the mind and try the heart to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And, of course, the ultimate um, working of that, working out of that was exile and uh, the punishment that came from not trusting in the Lord and not following his ways. If memory serves, in the other um, places where we get some kind of a contrast of blessing and woe, usually the blessing comes first, and then the woe is kind of like an echo of that. Um, here we get the we get the woe first, as it were, um, and it starts off with the curse rather than than the blessing. What is woe exactly? Um, I'm not sure because I I uh, looked it up in about. 10 different books and couldn't find an entry for woe. Um, maybe I can track that down online. Um, it's, it's one of those, um, oh, what do you call that part of speech where it's just, it just interrupts the flow. It's, it's like stop. You know, it's almost like a scream or something. Um, like woe is me? Well, it, it's, it's, it's similar to um, <clears throat> to a, uh, when Isaiah, when we find the word ho, ho doesn't really mean anything. It just means, hey. That's a southern prophecy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woe functions partially like that. And then the other part is, is it's an expression of lament. Um, and I wonder if it's almost, um, is it onomatopoeia that's... The sound, the... the yeah, the spelling the, the, is the sound. Right, right. It's just a word that it's made to write out a sound, like whoa, you yeah, know, that kind of. But it also makes me think of, you know, something really bad's happened to me. What would be? And yes. That's why. And we'll find that um, in, for example, the gospel, we have a list of woes. But there's no woe is me. It's <laughs> woe is the person that does this. You know, woe is you. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a way of, basically, I, I would, from the context, I would think it means sort of like a curse. You know, you will be yeah. taken aback with astonishment and sorrow uh, because of this. This will, this will catch up with you. It's the opposite of blessing. It was definitely, where, yes. I, where is it in the reading? Well, there is no woe in this reading. Oh, okay. It's here we have cursed, oh, okay. but the the uh, the uh, the parallel that's set up is um, a contrast <laughs> between woe and blessing. Here we have a contrast between cursing and blessing. Okay. Cursed is the man who <clears throat> trusts in human strength, trusts in man, trusts in the powers of society, trusts in his own skill, um, what have you. Um, now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't use the things around us, that we shouldn't use, you know, weapons or whatever if we need to use weapons. Um, but if, if we're thinking that that's where our ultimate security comes from, um, it, it just is not the source of ultimate security. The ultimate security comes only from the one who has control of everything, who is God. And this illustration is, he's like a shrub in the desert, like a little bush out all by himself, um, which immediately brings up a feeling of loneliness and abandonment. Um, if you trust in man, you're, in, you're going to end up finding yourself um, all alone when you're looking for help. And in doing so, trusting in man, the result is the heart turns away from the Lord. So if you um, 
if you trust in the Lord and the Lord tells you, um, take up your weapons, go talk to your friends, um, you know, in engage the problem in, in using worldly things, well, that's one thing. But if you put the world first, then you're turning your heart away from the Lord. Like a shrub in the desert won't see any good come. You shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, the driest, most uh, barren parts, and an uninhabited salt land. On the contrast, blessed is the one who does trust in the Lord, who finds strength there, who finds security there. Uh, unlike the uh, abandoned, lonely shrub in the desert, he's like a strong, sturdy tree planted by water that is fed continuously by the, uh, the roots that find the moisture therein. The leaves of that tree remain green, and they don't have to worry when uh, there may be a year of drought for a time because it's strong and it's deep and it's uh, by a place that is a, a, a proven water source. An oasis. An hmm? oasis. An oasis in the desert. Well, I guess so. I think an oasis would usually be by a spring. Here is a stream. Anyway. I'm not up on my what technically counts as an, <laughs> an oasis or not. <laughs> yes. And then uh, this analysis from the prophet, the heart, you know, if you're going to trust in man, ultimately you're trusting in yourself. Uh, may not be everything you're relying on your own personal strength, but you're trusting in your own kind. And the heart is deceitful. Your own heart, um, desperately corrupt. Other translations say wicked. Um, unfathomable. Um, who can understand it in the sense of, I think, two senses. Who can understand why in the world you would ultimately trust in something that fails you again and again? And the other one is, who can understand the human heart and why people do the things that they do and why they don't do the things that they don't do? Um, it's hard to figure out people sometimes. And essentially it comes back to that idea that they're corrupt uh, that they don't always follow a reasonable, logical um, line of thinking, that their actions are disordered because their heart is disordered. But that's no surprise to God. He says, I search the mind and I try the heart. I know all these things and I will deal with them according to what they deserve, according to the fruit of their doings. Well, we continue this um, illustration and this main point in a slightly different way when we get into Psalm 1. Can you see anything? Other notes I need to pick up from Father Fuller. No, not really. Um, Father Reardon has some nice comments on uh, Psalm 1. So before we read the psalm, let me read his comments so that we kind of pay attention to the things he points out. Uh, he points out how the whole Psalter begins with a note of beatitude. It starts off by saying, blessed is someone who basically pays attention to what you're about to read. You know, blessed is the one who meditates on the law of God uh, and what God has to say. He points out that there are three postures uh, that come into play, walking, standing, and sitting. And there are three places that the just man will not be found. So you won't find the righteous here, here, and here. Uh, following the counsel of the godless, standing in the way that sinners go, and seated among scoffers. Scoffer is an interesting word. Um, it's used here and in Isaiah, but it's found 14 times in the book of Proverbs. And it's uh, a word used for a, a consummate fool, um, which is a little bit different from, I think, the, uh, the feeling we get from the word scoffer in English. Um, I don't think of a fool so much as just somebody who's rude and mean. Um, but in Proverbs, it's somebody who's like that, and it, it's an illustration of their own undoing and of their own foolishness. Um, what is warned against in verse 1 is evil counsel. Um, and we find that, of course, in the stories of the Bible, many individuals are led astray by following evil counsel. Absalom, Rehoboam, Sennacherib, um, Amnon, Zedekiah, Ahaziah, 
the Sanhedrin under Caiaphas, and so on. Um, in contrast, we have an illustration of what the just man does. What does the just man do? Uh, well, first of all, not of anything that the wicked do that we found, found illustrated. The just man delights in the law of the Lord, in the Torah, and meditates on the Torah day and night. He says that the word meditation here could also be translated as muse or musing on the law. And that's also where we get the word amusement. And so there's this kind of sense of taking pleasure and delight in God's wisdom and God's ways, uh, finding fulfillment there. And what does that meditation lead to? Well, it leads to, of course, um, following, making God's will your own will. He says this habit of prayer, this incessant meditation on God's law, is not supposed to be something immediately useful. Trees do not bear fruit right away. First, they first must eat amply of the earth and drink deeply of its water. Such nourishment must serve first to build up the tree. The fruit will come later on when it's supposed to. The life of Christian prayer and meditation knows nothing of instant holiness. It's a matter of perseverance and patience. Some trees do not even begin to bear fruit for many years. And then finally he notes uh, the blessed man. Um, it says it's not man in general, mankind. Um, that would be Adam. We have the more specific, uh, gender-specific word, uh, ish, uh, for the male. And so we're not talking about um, mankind in general. We're talking about a particular person. Um, according to the fathers of the church, he is the one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. The law of the Lord, which is to be our delight in meditation day and night, finds its meaning only and ultimately in him. Christ is the one who fulfills the Torah, and he is the key to its understanding. So with that insight, let's look at Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that hath not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stood in the way of sinners. Stood in the way is like standing alongside in the way of sinners. And hath not sat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he will exercise himself day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the waterside that will bring forth his fruit in due season. His leaf also shall not wither, and look, whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. As for the ungodly, it is not so with them, but they are like the chaff which the wind scattereth away from the face of the earth. Therefore the ungodly shall not be able to stand in the judgment, neither the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish." So this last verse, verse 7, is very similar to uh, verse 10 from Jeremiah, that the Lord searches the mind, tries the heart. He knows the way of the righteous. He knows the way of the wicked. And he will make sure that the righteous ultimately are blessed and that the wicked are ultimately uh, cursed or woeful. Uh, also, we have this diversion in the ungodly, uh, in Jeremiah, the ungodly are this uh, lone shrub out in the desert. Um, in the psalm, the ungodly are like the chaff, um, which, you know, when you separate the wheat and the chaff, it's, it's very light, and it just, the wind quickly just takes it away. Um, and there's certainly a, a parallel of dryness there, and also of, I would say, helplessness. You know, the lone shrub out by itself where there's no water, just has no hope. Also, the, the, the chaff, you know, there's almost no hope if you're outdoors of keeping it contained. It's just the wind is going to pick it up just because it's, it's so, so light and it'll immediately just drift off. So the ungodly are helpless in a sense because they don't turn to the only one who can be their true help, which is God. Any other things that you notice? I like it when it says his delight, his pleasure, his amusement 
is in the law of the Lord. And there's certainly that, that growing edge where at first we begin to obey God just because we have to, and we're told to, or we might fear punishment. But then there's that maturity where we come to see the wisdom in it and appreciate the benefit of it and uh, love it for its own self and begin to delight in what God wants and commands. It really does take a lot of life experiences to really see, you know, oh, that mm -hmm. old Bible, you know, yeah. you know, it doesn't have any relevance, uh, relevancy, relevance, relevancy. Um, and the older you get, the more you see that our problems are universal. But what is, what, uh, in verse two, uh, and that second stanza, he will exercise himself day and night. Exactly what does exercise mean there? Well, I think that's a way of saying he'll actually follow through with it. He'll, he'll comply with the law. Let me see how it translates it here. He will engage in, he'll busy himself in, in the law. He will exercise himself. He will. Yeah, the, li literally it says he just, he meditates on it day and night. Mm -hmm. okay. He exercises his mind, I guess, is what uh, Coverdale was getting at here. E or exercises his uh, meditation. You can also, see, of course, the, the man is Jesus, who has followed, followed God's commandments and God's ways. And throughout his ministry, you can see this um, illustration of Jesus against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and uh, different people who are opposing him. And you can see the difference between them, how Jesus delights in God's law and God's wisdom. And the others have been corrupted, um, and they're following their own way. They've, um, they've fallen for corrupt counsel, and they've... Uh, fallen into corrupt ways and um, and so on. Well, let's turn to the um, epistle, which is very different uh, from what we've encountered before. We'll pick up on the main theme again when we get to the gospel. But as we've, we've mentioned before, the epistle in the three-year lectionary is not meant necessarily to pa pair up thematically. Um, if memory serves, I think we just continue... Uh, right after the verse where we started, or where we stopped last time. Um, let's see, this is verse 12. What is verse 11? Yeah, I believe that's where we stopped last time. In any case, Paul here is continuing on talking about the resurrection. He uh, gave us last time kind of a litany of some early creedal affirmations. Um, and he says, look, this is what we preach to you. This is what we received from the Lord. This is our faith. And so he kind of works that out a bit when we get to 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12, down to verse 20. Now, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now the main connection which we are, we have some tendency to forget um, is kind of the key to interpreting this text. And that is that the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of the last day, the general resurrection, is a part of the same thing. So remember that Paul talks about the resurrection of Jesus being the first fruits of all of those who have fallen asleep. 
or the first fruit. Um, so they are intimately connected. And that's why it took everybody so off guard when Jesus rose from the dead. Because like, wait a minute, it's not judgment day. There's no angels gathering the righteous and the wicked. And um, so Jesus is kind of like this preview or foretaste of the resurrection of the last day. Um, so it, it implies other things, of course, unique to Christ, his own vindication. You know, the, the courts of heaven have overturned the verdict of earth. He is not guilty. He's innocent. He's vindicated. Um, but it, it also has this intimate connection with the resurrection of the last day, the restoration of all things, the redemption of all things. And so we have to keep that in mind when we read this. So some of them are saying, when they say there is no resurrection, they're talking about there is no end time, last day, resurrection of the dead. And so Paul's like, well, no, wait a minute. Let's think about that. We have preached to you and you have affirmed already that Jesus rose from the dead. So how can you believe both of those two things? Because those go together. You know, you can't have Jesus rising from the dead and yet there's no resurrection at the end of time. And you can't believe there's no there's a resurrection at the end of time and that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Those are connected together. And so that's kind of the basic main point that he makes, uh, kind of going over it meticulously, kind of back and forth. Of course, there's this wonderful um, realization of the, the gravity of the situation. Um, if the dead are not raised, Christ isn't raised. Christ isn't raised. What are we doing here? You know, it's our faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Jesus has no power to liberate you from your sins and from your own death if he can't even liberate himself from his own death. Um, and so all of those who have died, you know, you're never going to see them again. That's it. It's over. And he says, if if all we have is this life um, in our hope in Christ, then uh, we are of all men most to be pitied. But don't worry, that's not the case. Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which means all of these people, your friends, relatives, who have died in Christ, you will see them again and share life with them again. <laughs> Let's see if we have any <coughs> church father comments here. Interesting, Augustine addresses this idea of, a, you know, we're perpetuating a fraud if Christ is not risen from the dead. He says, if a lie directed against the temporal life of another is detestable, how much more so is one prejudicial to his eternal life? such as every lie voiced in the teaching of religion. On that account, the apostle terms it false witness if anyone lies about Christ, even in what might seem to pertain to his praise. And then uh, Cyr oh, today's saint, uh, Cyril of Alexandria. For the sake of all, Christ tasted death, although by nature he was life and was himself the resurrection. He surrendered his own body to death. By his ineffable power, he trampled upon death in his own flesh, that he might become the firstborn from the dead and the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Even if the resurrection of the dead may be said to be through a man, the man we know it is through is the word begotten of God. The power of death has been destroyed through him. And this also brings up Something that um, in, I don't know if it's really unique to uh, American Christianity. I think it's more of a Western thing. But we tend to forget about the resurrection and, and the new earth and the new creation. And we just, our mind sort of stops with pie in the sky and the sweet by and by and that'll last forever. You know, we'll be sitting on clouds and playing harps and so on. And then we don't go to the end of the book and see, well, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And in fact, heaven and earth basically overlap when God comes down to live with his people on earth. So the, the new earth is the new heaven because heaven 
is really just a way of saying where God makes his home. And so the lamb dwells in the midst of the city, in the midst of his people, and uh, the trees of life are there, and that's where everybody is, and so on. And a, a lot of uh, theological work for the last, well, I guess since the kind of return to sources in the 1950s and 60s, going back to early ideas about uh, the Hebrew perspective on the integration of body and spirit and uh, the reality and centrality of the resurrection uh, of the dead and the new creation. Uh, it's gotten a lot of renewed emphasis in those past decades. Well, let's go back to our blessings and woes in Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. This is the Sermon on the Plain. Um, I think it's literally on a level place. Of course, it sounds very much like the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is much longer. Uh, it begins with the Beatitudes, but then it goes on for several chapters, of four chapters or something. Um, this is much uh, shorter, uh, and it has its own Beatitudes. Um, now this, this basically uh, wraps up at the, at the end of chapter 6, the Sermon on the Plain. It's also a little bit different in terms of whom it's directed to. So the, the context is, is like uh, Jesus speaks in the midst of the crossroads of life. You know, people are mingling and going by, and he, he says a word not to the people at large, like in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, but more specifically to his disciples. He's speaking to them in the midst of other people. Oh, and, the, and when, talk, when it begins with Jesus came down with the 12 apostles, um, he had gone up on a mountain and basically uh, set aside or ordained uh, the 12 as apostles. Um, and so that's where he's coming down with them from. So Luke 6, beginning in verse 17, Jesus came down with the 12 apostles and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came forth from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets." But woe to you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you that are full now, for you shall hunger. Woe to you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for, their father, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Now, it, I, I suppose you can never really answer this question, but it's a thing perhaps to ponder. Um, giving that explicitly he's with a mixed crowd, um, is he sort of like turning to his disciples, saying, blessed are you? And is he turning to the strangers and saying, woe to you? I don't know. Or is he kind of speaking that to everyone generically? Some of the things to look at before we get really into the blessings and woes, um, the Roman Catholic lectionary um, has verse 17 and then it skips to 20. So basically it, it has a verse introducing the scene and then it skips right into the, uh, the Beatitudes. And what it skips over is this um, Jesus heals people of their diseases and uh, this power went out from him. And we find this intriguing little detail mentioned elsewhere in the Gospels. Um, like when the, when the woman with an issue of blood uh, touches him you know, like from, from behind and just grabs the hem of his garment and says, the power went out from him. 
um, you almost get like a you know special effects movie special effects in your mind of there's this blue glow and there's this zap or something um, there's also a very interesting um, thing in the I think it's in John maybe I should try to look it up where they come to arrest him and it says something very much like that where uh, the power goes out from him and knocks the guards down Well, doesn't somebody cut cut off a guard's ear and he replaces it? Yeah, but I don't know if that's in John. Let me see. Okay. He attaches it. Yeah, Simon Peter drew out his sword, stuck, struck the high priest's servant, cut off his ear. That guy's name was Malchus. Um, Jesus said, put your sword away. And he healed him. So it's not in John. I wonder if it's in Luke then. I remember blogging about this one time. I should have gone back and looked it up. Well, I don't see it there. I know it's there somewhere. I read about it in black and white and red. <laughs> I got to find it now. In red, huh? Let's see. Prayer in the garden. Uh, let's see. Mark a mob kissed him drew his sword caught off his ear and then the young man grabs his tunic let's see Matthew It says it's in John. Okay. But it doesn't. Maybe I just missed it. Um, John 18. Maybe. Yeah. Try that. 4 through 6. Just as the Roman soldiers and temple police were preparing to arrest Jesus, the supernatural power was suddenly released. It was so strong it literally knocked them down. Which verse? Uh, it says 18, 4 <coughs> through 6. Is that? Chapter 18, verse 4. Yeah. I guess it's verse 6. When Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. It sounds like that translation is hiding something. That is apparent in another translation. Anyway, it's, yeah, it's verse 6. Maybe you can see what that is in something else. So there is definitely kind of this discernible, otherworldly, supernatural effect that is sensed by at least some, this power that went forth from him. And that's how it's used to describe it. Also, one of the things, one of the misconceptions we have is that Jesus didn't heal everybody. Um, but except for, um, like in Nazareth, when they kick him out of the synagogue and said he didn't do any miracles there, um, everywhere that he does miracles, there's nobody who gets turned away. Um, everybody gets healed. Now, he, he, he's not constantly doing this 24-7, um, like, you know, get in line, you know, with the rest of the world. Um, but everywhere he's doing some healings, he doesn't like, okay, I'm going to do five of you and the rest go home. He just stays there until um, everybody gets taken care of. 
And that's, for some reason, we don't remember that or perceive it that way or something. I'm a little Always before, when there's been this great multitude of people, Jesus has either gone up on the mountain so he can be seen or gone out in his tiny boat to, to not be necessarily separated, but so that the focus could yeah. be. Here, on the one hand, he comes to this level place in the midst of all of these people with his disciples. And whether he's trying to say to the people, I have given them special, uh, don't confuse them with me, but they are set apart from everyday people, or whether he's trying to say to the disciples, yes, you do have special powers, sort of, but remember that you are more man, you won't be exactly as me, because you are fully man. That, that juxtaposition of all those people, I think, confuses me as to what his real purpose is that day. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, of course, that the Beatitudes here, just like in the Sermon on the Mount, is the introduction to a much longer talk. So, for example, um, what does he address afterward? He talks about loving your enemies, um, not uh, judging uh, people. Can the blind lead the blind? Won't they both fall into a pit? Um, he doesn't go on nearly as long as in the Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about um, a, a good tree bears good fruit, bad tree bears doesn't bear bad fruit. It doesn't bear fruit. Um, and he also he sort of wraps it up with this illustration of uh, building on a solid foundation. I wonder if he's not, there's not, he's not trying to say e either one of those things. He just is teaching his disciples. But because of who he is, everybody follows him everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so he's, everyone basically gets the benefit of what he's saying to them. They can hear him, they are healed by him, but he's talking to them. I thought so too. It would be, it says, he lifted his eyes upon his disciples and said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a teaching moment. And it may be one of those things where you want to be deliberately overheard by outsiders. And it's kind of a, almost an invitation, yeah. an illustration that there are, there, there's two ways. And that's, the, of course, the theme that we have in these other readings. Uh, there's the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And it may not be the way that you thought. And I think that's also a part of the idea of these contrasts, you know, the, the poor and the rich. You know, you may have thought that the way of the rich was the way of God, the way of prosperity and blessing, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, the way of the poor uh, is the way of blessing because they are the ones who don't trust in man and the strength of man. They trust in God alone. Um, the hungry, the full, the weeping, the laughing, uh, those hated, those spoken well of, and then kind of wrapping up with uh, being treated like the prophets, the real prophets, and being treated like the false prophets. Of course, uh, Matthew uh, spiritualizes these things. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. Um, and I don't think they're necessarily saying different things. Um, but I think in, in this... Um, contrast here that Matthew, his version in the Sermon on the Mount doesn't have the same kind of contrast that we find here. Um, if, you, if, you, if you would say like poor in spirit, um, then you would have to tweak rich, you know, rich in falsity, I don't know, rich in pompousness. I think you're it talking about... It kind of about makes it more difficult to Hammer Materially, home. yeah. But you have received your consolation. You got the good stuff up front. Mm -hmm. right? You got what you thought was the good stuff. Exactly. Yeah. More to the point. Yeah. And it's you were wrong, <laughs> but you're not. 
I think it all really goes back to Jeremiah's introduction. Cursed is the man who trusts in man, um, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. That's kind of it, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Because the poor and the hungry and the weeping and those who are hated, those are all going to be seeking and searching and open to God's grace. And those who are rich and full and laughing and well-regarded, they have all they need and they're not looking for any, anything else from God. Re uh, rejoice and leap for joy in that day. Your reward is great in heaven. Woe to you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you that are full now, for then, later on, you shall hunger, and so on. If you're putting all your confidence in a passing world, then it's in the wrong place. Don't trust anybody. <laughs> That's one of the things that I remember, you know, the things that Father just mm -hmm. said, too. Thought that was a little harsh, but then he explained it, and I went, "Yeah, that's right. No, don't put your hope in in man, in, in folks. They're gonna let you down." Yep. <laughs> let me. Uh... My dad put it in a much simpler way: people are no damn good. <laughs> <laughs> he said that all the time. Yeah. Something would happen, and he'd go, yeah, "People, people are, are no damn good." <laughs> that's what. That's what we got. Well, let's close with uh, Gregory of Nyssa and his comment here. The Christian who is advanced by means of good discipline and the gift of the Spirit to the measure of the age of reason experiences glory and pleasure and enjoyment that is greater than any human pleasure. These come to one after grace is given to him, after being hated because of Christ, uh, being driven and enduring every insult and shame on behalf of his faith in God. For such a person whose entire life centers on the resurrection and future blessings, every insult and scourging and persecution and other sufferings leading up to the cross are all pleasure and refreshment and surety of heavenly treasures. For Jesus says, Blessed are you when men reproach you and persecute you and speak falsely against you, saying all manner of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice and exult, because your reward is great in heaven. All right. Can we go back to that scourging bit? <laughs> Blessed are you when you're scourged? <laughs> well, and you know, Paul would learn to say that because um, he, you know, got the lash multiple times. And uh, he says, you know, I'm, look, in hindsight, I find it all to be worth it um, because of the glory, the surpassing worth of the things that are to come and that I got so many people to be a part of it. Well, 